Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's 1 p.m. Central Time. Uh, this is Steve Wilson from the State Water Survey, um, and you're attending a webinar on what environmental health professionals need to know. Um, this is funded through the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, which RCAP is a technical assistance and training provider uh, that supports small systems and private well owners around the country, and their funding comes, uh, and ours, through US EPA. So the private well class has been around now for about five years, and um, it's through this program that we're able to put these webinars on and work with our partners, um, NEHA and others, uh, uh, to raise awareness of private well issues. So uh, quickly before we get started, this is an EHP webinar. It's meant for environmental health professionals. So I'm assuming a lot of you are here uh, to also get CEs. Um, I want to mention that um, talking to NEHA, it's a two-year cycle for your credentials through them. And if that's uh, the case, just be aware that we did do this webinar, uh, very similar, the basically the same core content on May 8th and last November. And so um, if you're in the same accrediting cycle, um, or credentialing cycle, I guess, uh, you, you can't get credit for it twice. Um, but we do have um, also a lot of folks who are getting their state LEHP credentials. And so Katie Hollenbeck, who's on uh, the call with us, uh, who works for us here, can get you a certificate of attendance, a slide deck, and a can help you complete the NEHA forms. And if you look on your GoToWebinar dashboard, um, there is a downloadable file um, on for CD, CE attendance that you can download. Okay, so that said, uh, today's webinar, again, is part of this program um, for private well owners that's being implemented through RCAP, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership. And we're at the University of Illinois at the State Water Survey. Um, we are recording this, and we record every webinar, so if you go on privatewellclass.org and look at our website and go to videos, um, you can find uh, probably about 40 now or up to uh, webinars that are related to private well issues. Um, some of those are repeated um, for well owners every three or four months, and again, this one has been too, but um, I want to mention uh, the National Environmental Health Association, who's a great partner to us, and um, there is a version of our class even on their website, and uh, we work closely together to uh, try to wear, raise awareness of these issues. I know we had a number of questions from you all about um, how to get more education on private well issues, and that's really what we're after here. Um, what we've learned is that there aren't a lot of uh, private well programs for EHPs and others, and so we're trying to provide that information through this class and, and through our partners. So um, we had a ton of questions. We won't get to all of them, but if something comes up during the call, um, there's you can use your GoToWebinar uh, dashboard for either question or it might be chat, depending on what yours looks like, to ask questions. Katie's going to track that, and at the end we'll have time for her to follow that up. But um, so. Um, I'm Steve Wilson. I'm a groundwater hydrologist at the State Water Survey, and Katie Hollenbeck is also with us. She's a water resources outreach specialist here and works on the private well class. Um, so she is fielding questions that come up on uh, the GoToWebinar screen. Um, and also then Dan Webb, who's the head of our public service lab at the State Water Survey. And when we get to the questions, all the water quality related questions, those are Dan's domain. Um, so Illinois is fortunate to have a public service lab that's funded through the state that until 2011, I believe, offered free water sampling for inorganics and metals to any private well owner. And now it's, there's a fee associated with it because of our state budget, but it's still um, it's a great service uh, to have that information. And since we also house all the state's well logs uh, th that are required by law to be filed in the state, um, it gives us a lot of information to support well owners uh, here and uh, now around the country. So um, what we're going to talk about today is some of the issues and challenges we face, both, uh, you know, my job here at the water survey uh, in the groundwater section is to do research related to groundwater, usually applied type research, and also support um, well issues around the state of Illinois. And a lot of that in involves private well owners. Uh, so. Um, 
I face the same issues a lot of county health department or local health district health folks face when dealing with well owners. Every well is unique. There's a lot of different issues, and uh, we really learn by experience is uh, what I've learned. So I will talk about that and well owner attitudes and just well owners in general and why they're so difficult to reach out to. It's estimated that over two-thirds of well owners have never sampled their well, and you know why is that the case? Um, a little bit about groundwater and wells, some basics of well construction, and then I'll, I'll, at the end I want to talk about uh, kind of the gap between groundwater and health professionals. There really is, um, you know, as a groundwater person, my role is not necessarily public health protection, although it's becoming more and more that way because of these efforts, um, where a health professional isn't necessarily a groundwater expert, and there's a lot of room there for us to uh, to coexist and to try to uh, supplement what each other know. So. Uh, and lastly, we, you know, if you're not familiar with our private well class program, uh, there's a lot of good resources there uh, to help you learn more about wells, about private well issues, and uh, to share with well owners that you might be serving. So, okay, so there are a lot of issues related to public wells or to private wells, but really they come down to these are the things that we're most concerned about: public health protection, um, then also source water quality protection so that we aren't damaging groundwater for somebody else and really just water quality in general and making sure the water that we drink is safe. So um, that takes on a number of different roles, if you will, but it comes down to these three basic things um, in about every case. So there are other issues, things that are in the news. This is a picture of a well that's in a floodplain. They were smart enough to just extend the casing up till about 10 feet above land surface. So when that uh, area floods, assuming that's properly grouted, that well doesn't have a chance of being overtopped uh, and causing a bacteria problem in the well. But we hear about those things. There's, you know, there's drought, there's, you know, wildfires going on in California today, uh, flooding issues, and uh, this term about non-regulated drinking water, they're all in the news and they're buzzwords, but it, those aren't the real issues we face. Um, um, oh, I guess I left the slide out here. Let me go back. Um, yeah. Oh, there we go. I just got ahead of myself. Uh, really, the challenge is uh, the differences in how private wells are dealt with. So um, it's different in every state, uh, sometimes in even local jurisdictions. So you know how to define what a private well is, uh, what states require permits and, and well logs to be submitted. You know, there are some states like Illinois that started um, requiring well logs in 1968. Um, and that's one of the earlier states. The uh, state of New York didn't require well logs until 2000. Um, Mississippi requires permitting, but if a well is five inches or less in diameter, a lot of times I, I don't think they're required to submit those logs. And so the state doesn't have a lot of the information or the counties uh, or local health districts on where even the wells are in their area to understand how big of an issue it might be. And I mentioned New Jersey versus Pennsylvania here. Um, in New Jersey, about 15 years ago, they passed a law that requires uh, the state to come out and test a well anytime there's a property transfer. So New Jersey collects about 13,000 samples a year of uh, the well water in their state, all over the state. Um, and now that's been 15 years or more running. So they have a ton of great information about their natural water quality, well issues, well, well construction issues versus Pennsylvania, which has struggled, uh, even though there's a lot of grassroots efforts in Pennsylvania to uh, support uh, education to well owners and requiring some of those things, the state hasn't passed any laws that require wells to meet a construction code or to license their drillers. So that's a real problem. Um, some counties have taken upon themselves to require a well driller to drill in their county. They have to have um, it, there's no state license to be had, so they require them to be a master driller under the National Groundwater Association's uh, program in order to drill in that county. Um, so it's, you know, there's really a wide variety of rules, and that makes enforcement and also even understanding what the problems are uh, really tough to understand. Um, county health departments aren't adequately trained. Um, we had a, a bunch of questions from folks asking about more training for private wells, about private wells. Um, and what it leads to is a very unorganized approach 
in a lot of the country. You may have one county where um, an LH, uh, LAHP is very interested in private well issues and has made that kind of their pet project and does a lot with well owners where in another area they may not be doing anything um, versus in some states out east where you have local health districts. Um, one health district may have a lot of rules related to private wells that they've decided to instill on their own where the district next door may have no rules at all. And so um, it really makes it tough uh, for a well owner and for um, educating folks on uh, all those issues. And what I meant to get to earlier is even though we have things like floods and fires and a lot of things that are in the news, these are really the three issues that need to be addressed um, that we've learned nationally. Poor well construction. So what happens is when a new well uh, code is developed by a state, so in Illinois, for instance, we changed our dug and board well, our board well code probably about 10 or 15 years ago to require 10 feet of uh, clay material before the, the wide part of the di large diameter part of the well um, is in place. But any well that was already constructed is grandfathered in, and that's the case in every state. Um, there are no rules that say you have to go back and make your well meet the new code and so you have many older wells. Um, I know working with the RCAP folks we work with around the country, they've found wells that are over 100 years old that people are still using. Sometimes those wells are perfectly fine, um, but a lot of times they weren't built uh, with a modern uh, water quality concerns in mind. Um, and so they don't meet code and they're really, you know, they're a source of contamination. So um, another issue is abandoned wells. Uh, there's probably more abandoned wells uh, in the United States than there are wells in use. And, uh, you know, people find those the hard way sometimes. And um, they also provide a conduit into an aquifer uh, or a groundwater supply uh, for contaminants. And so um, those two things are two of the biggest issues related to wells themselves. And the third thing is lack of well owner knowledge and education. Well owners uh, just believe their well is safe and uh, it's from the ground, it's out in the country, if you will. I know um, I grew up on a hand dug well that my dad, my grandpa actually um, hand dug in 1933. It's only 14 feet deep. It's in the bottom of a ravine where water can run in from both sides. Um, it's in the middle of a pasture that had livestock and um, when it rained our water would be cloudy. So it has direct surface uh, influence and yet my dad always swore our well water was better than city water um, because it didn't have those contaminants in it. And so, um, you know, it's that lack of understanding and just a belief that groundwater is safe is one of our biggest uh, enemies, if you will, in educating well owners about the need to sample and, and those things. Um, so a little bit about well owners and what we've learned in our, our work. Uh, the, the problem is they come from every demographic, every social class, economic class, and educational class. In the same county, you can have uh, an 11,000 square foot house that's built by someone who's the president of a company who decided to live out in the country and, you know, uh, PhD educated, all those things uh, in the same area with someone who maybe is living below the poverty line. They've maybe lived there or that it's their grandpa grandparents old farm and the well's, you know, 80 years old. Um, you've got all those folks to reach and different, there's, you know, different ways to reach them. And so um, some have been on a well their entire life, grew up on a farm. Others decided to buy a house in the country and maybe um, have lived in the city their whole life. We had a, uh, a professor here at the University of Illinois who called us, who came from New York, had always been on city water, um, didn't know what to do whenever um, all of a sudden one morning he didn't have uh, any running water because he knew there was a well there, but he had no idea what to do with it. And so, um, you know, well ownership is a responsibility is the bottom line and what we try to teach people. Um, and it could be, you know, an area like where we're at, it's fairly rural with one, uh, one community of about 150,000 people, um, or it could be extremely rural like where I grew up or a very urban setting like Cook County, Illinois, which is mostly Chicago proper. And um, I bring that up because um, trying to figure out well owners and, you know, how to get them to test and understand the responsibility they have 
is really something that it's been studied, it's been looked at, and it's really just a hard uh, nut to crack, if you will. Um, this study by Barb uh, Laconin and a number of others uh, in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan, they did a survey where they sent this uh, questionnaire out to almost 2,700 people. They got 1,700 responses. Uh, they tried a variety of methods here to try to get responses, including $2 bills and free coupons. Um, but the real question or the real problem here is of the 1,700 respondents, about 1,100 had never sampled their well. And when you look at the bottom left here, 87% uh, were only slightly or not worried at all about their health risks, even though they had never sampled. And they were given a laundry list. This list on the right is the top 10. Um, why didn't, haven't you tested? You know, 53% said we've been drinking it for years, all the way down to 8%, number 10, say I don't want to know. And I have a really good example of that. Um, I was doing a research study where we were sampling private wells to look at arsenic uh, in an area of Illinois where there's known arsenic in the groundwater. It's naturally occurring. And um, this well owner said, you can test my well if you don't send me the results and you do it when I'm not home. And when I asked him why he would want me to do that, he said it's because he was trying to sell his home. And the law in Illinois requires you to fill out a questionnaire when you're selling your house. Uh, and if it has a well, you have to list anything you know of that might be a problem with the well. And he wanted to be able to honestly answer that question. He had no idea um, because he was afraid of what it might do to his property value. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a huge problem. Um, and there's a lot of those sort of issues going on around the country. Um, we tell people they should test the well before they buy a house. In some areas, if you wait even two days to put a bid on a house, you'll lose it. And, uh, you know, I tell folks, in my opinion, it's not worth it. Um, you may be treating it or you may find out you don't have enough water. Um, there's a lot of issues that come along with owning a private well uh, that you need to be aware of first before you uh, step into that uh, investment. So um, why don't people test? Uh, here's, you know, either they don't know, didn't know I should test, I don't know how, and that's kind of on us as health professionals and those who are uh, working with well owners. Um, we need, there needs to be more uh, targeted education. The problem is because wells aren't regulated and there's no requirement for testing, um, a lot of times, especially at a local or county level, um, there's no funding for those programs. And so uh, it's a catch-22, if you will, but we need to find a way to, to work around that. And the other part of it is, um, you know, people just aren't uh, aware. You know, they, they've been drinking it for years, so they just assume it's safe. They don't understand the risk, and that's something else we can deal with. So, um, so why are they hard to reach? Um, I've mentioned some of these things already, but, you know, just a belief that groundwater is safe. Um, human nature, why don't you go to the dentist when you need to? Um, it's the same type of thing. You don't want to know what's in the well. It hasn't done anything to me yet. Um, I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, there's cost and perceived cost. Uh, as far as uh, if I find something in my well and I have to add treatment, that's really going to cost a lot of money I don't have. Um, and so you can look at this list here, just independence of a lot of people. Uh, when uh, folks in a rural area want to be left alone, they don't trust uh, any type of government entity, and uh, they feel like they can take care of it themselves. So um, as far as aquifers and wells, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, well types and some basics that, you know, everyone should really understand about wells. And we're in a glaciated area of Illinois where we have uh, three or 400 feet of uh, unconsolidated material, sand and gravel, clay, and silt over top of the consolidated bedrock. In many parts of the country, bedrocks add or near the surface. And so there's really three types of wells. There are dug or bored wells, and those are usually installed where there's no, quote, real aquifer, um, or in like, like the case of my, uh, the well my grandpa put in, uh, that's just what you did back in the 30s. You drilled, you dug your own well. So, um, but if there is no really good sand and gravel aquifer and there's no good bedrock supply, a lot of times uh, the only option is a dug or bored well, which is like a large, uh, it, it's almost akin to a cistern. It's a large diameter um, vertical uh, opening with uh, that allows you to store water. So the whole point of having the large diameter well that might be three foot diameter 
versus a regular drilled well that might be a five or six inch casing is so that you have volume of water there because water doesn't seep in very fast like it would if there was a real aquifer there. Um, drilled or driven wells in sand and gravel, the really difference between a, a drilled well in sand and gravel versus consolidated rock is a well in sand and gravel has a screen, and I'll talk about that in a second, versus a rock well, most of the time those are uh, open hole, meaning that you drill through the solid rock, you put casing down to the rock, and then the rest of it is an open hole uh, where the rock itself is the casing, and you can take advantage of the fracture. So, um, you know, in some cases you have choices. I know right here where we're at, um, I can drill a well in two different sand and gravel aquifers, depending on how deep I want to go, or I could go down to the bedrock, and there's water in the bedrock as well. Um, most people put a well in the shallowest unit that's available because there's no sense spending that extra money, but there certainly are cases where uh, the water quality is different between aquifers, and you may want to put a well in a deeper aquifer um, than the shallower one. So the, the whole point is to understand those differences. And if you're with a county health department, um, the one thing I can tell you is you should have a relationship with your state geological survey or an Illinois state water survey as well. Um, a lot of source water work has been done looking at water quality and understanding the geology of your, of your state by those folks and they can probably give you a lot of good information about um, if you're not, a, if you're not uh, aware or up on those things on uh, well types, types of wells in your area, what's the most typical type of well based on the, the aquifers that are available. Um, okay, so for a dug and board well, as I mentioned, a large diameter, if you look closely at this picture, you can see right underneath the guy's feet, uh, on the ground is a three foot diameter hole and they've just used that big auger rig to pull up a big chunk slug of, of unconsolidated uh, basically soil and um, so here they're going to drill a hole that's three foot diameter or a little more and then um, eventually they'll put concrete tile vertically in uh, through there along with gravel on the outside and maybe some on the inside as well and then water can seep in from the water table uh, which is you know um, every place has a water table, which means if you dig down enough, you'll reach uh, a point where the soil is completely saturated and there's a free water surface. If you had a hole there, um, that's not necessarily an aquifer. You have a free water table, even if it's all clay, um, but it's it, water can seep in slowly, and that's the whole point of one of these types of wells. Um, these are all three dugger board wells, the one on the upper left, is an old hand dug well that uh, the, the farmer who lives at this place um, has been using this well for who knows how long, probably several generations. Um, they've got two by tens over top of it with uh, some tin on top of that and it's all being held down by bricks and concrete blocks. If you look at those uh, four posts that are meant to protect the well, they look like they've been rubbed raw and that's because they have. This is a cattle pasture. The cattle use those posts as scratching posts. Uh, they're, you know, they're defecating there. Uh, water can seep right in the ground there. It's on a sloped hill. There's a cornfield um, upslope from it. Um, so water, whenever there's a large rainstorm, is being washed through there. Um, it's just not a very safe uh, way to have your water supply. Um, the one on the right, is a uh, three foot diameter uh, concrete tiled well with a concrete cap. Uh, these are pretty typical as well. And the well on the lower left is also a three foot diameter well, but the upper 10 feet is only a six inch pipe uh, coming to the surface uh, with clay fills around that upper 10 feet to give it some protection from the surface. The one on the left, um, if it's not grouted uh, along the outside well, then uh, each of those concrete tile are four foot sections typically. And that means if that's a foot above land surface, that there's a seam at three feet below land surface. So it's much more likely that something from the surface could seep in at three feet than below 10 feet. Um, and so that's why uh, that's a typical, typical construction today. Okay, so here's those two examples. Um, the one on the left is with the concrete tile coming all the way up to the surface. You can see the concrete tile uh, seams where the sections fit together. 
they're not cemented they just sit on top of each other um, you can see this shows six inch concrete uh, grout around the outside to help protect it and then uh, the water levels down uh, into this uh, far, fairly far down um, below land surface and water seeping in along the gravel on the outside and getting into those seams you can see that shows thin sand lenses because there is no real aquifer and the one on the right is the same type of design except um, it's got the same amount of water in it because it's the water level in the, the shallow uh, soil there but it's got clean earth fill it shows for the upper 10 feet uh, to help protect uh, from surface contamination so a sand and gravel well, as I mentioned, is finished in a sand and gravel aquifer. So this is a steel uh, wound screen, and usually the casing is either PVC or steel, but the screen is typically stainless steel, or sometimes it's PVC. And uh, the driller usually sizes, uh, uses the size of well screen that matches the sand and gravel particle size in the aquifer. So if you have a fine sand, you're going to have a tighter wound screen with smaller openings than if you have more of a gravel that's got larger openings so that um, it lets the water in but not uh, the sand. And so um, the one thing about a sand and gravel well, and I'll show you a diagram here. Um, well, I'm going to show you a log first, I guess. This is just a typical log, uh, an Illinois log. And you can see the geology down in the lower right. Uh, there's four feet of topsoil and then 41 feet of sand and gravel. So this is an area where sand's at the surface or near the surface. And so um, an area that's like that means that water only has to travel four feet to get down into the aquifer versus if this was at, you know, the sand was at 180 to 200 feet, um, your screen is at the bottom of that. So you can see up here, uh, this is a four foot screen, number 14. And uh, so the water's coming from sand and gravel from 41 to 45 feet. And that's because uh, the water's got to travel down to 41 feet to get in the screen. The rest of the casing's solid. And that's a big difference uh, versus a, a bedrock well, which I'll explain in a second. But if you're uh, used to these logs, uh, I know in Illinois, uh, a driller has to follow uh, a log with the county health department. And so, um, we see all this information as it comes into our office. The difference then with a bedrock well is that typically you only have casing down into the rock a little ways. So um, the casing is called seeded into the rock 10 to 20 feet below the top of the bedrock. So it's, you know, so it's solid rock, not weathered uh, where it might uh, give way or not, might not be a good seal. And then after that, it's an open hole. So that um, if this was a 200 foot well, and it was 20 feet to bedrock, then there's only 30 feet of casing here and the other 170 feet is all open hole. Um, versus a 200 foot sand and gravel well, as I mentioned before, if it's a five foot screen, water's coming in from 195 to 200. And that gives you a lot more protection from the surface uh, as far as something trying to make its way down into, uh, to get into your well for a sand and gravel well versus a bedrock well. And what that means is these fractures, depending on how common they are, that's the thin blue lines on this diagram. Um, you can have those fractures, like in this example, they show running uh, at an angle. Um, so if bedrock is at the surface nearby, you could have a fracture that runs up near the surface. And so then uh, water from the surface, is, it's easier for it to get in those fractures. And that's why karst topography, it's, um, which is... Uh, weathered limestone um, that uh, causes caves and sinkholes because water can uh, dissolute that uh, material so easily those areas typically have a lot of coliform problems um, because a lot of material from the surface is making its way down into those aquifers so depending on the type of rock you have and how deep your well is um, and even the fractures the type of fractures you have um, all can make things uh, either more or less vulnerable uh, as far as a bedrock well goes. Um, the water is running through those fractures, and so they almost are like pipes or conduits. Um, the entire, and it's like in a sand and gravel aquifer, the entire uh, sand and gravel aquifer is full of water. You know, the porosity of a sand is about 30%, so if you have 100 feet of sand, 30 feet of that is water if it's full um, versus 
bedrock where it's running through the fractures. Um, in a sandstone or a really fractured uh, limestone, it may be 10 to 15 percent of, of open space that can hold water. In a granite situation, like uh, you know, if you have a house on a cabin uh, in the mountains in Colorado, uh, granite typically has um, one to two percent fracturing, if that. And so we see a lot of cases, uh, like out in Colorado in the mountains, where um, they may have a well that only pumps a, gal a half a gallon a minute, something like that. So it really depends on the type of rock and, and all those issues um, as far as understanding what the risks are for that particular well. And so here's a well log for um, a bedrock well. And if you look at the formations pass through number 18 in the bottom left, or bottom right, excuse me, you can see they went through limestone from 189 to 257, 68 feet thick. So that's where the water's coming from. And so if you go back up to the casing and liner pipe number 15, they put in 179 feet of PVC. This PVC is not as sturdy. It could be cracked. And then to seed it in the bedrock, they went 10 feet into the rock to 199, and um, they used 20 feet of, of steel casing from 179 to 199. So below 199, that's an open hole. And uh, you can see they hit shale at 150, or 257, so they basically stop there. Shale is uh, basically cemented clay, and so it really has no, um, uh, it doesn't release water very easily. And so the water here, they actually made a mistake on this log. It says, um, number 12 says water from shale, 257 to 260. Um, my guess would be that um, someone in the office at the drilling company filled this out, and they're used to looking at the bottom formation on that sheet. And so they saw hard gray shale, uh, three feet, and they put that in there. But what that should say is water from limestone, uh, 189 to 257. So, and there's no screen uh, because it's open hole. So it's, you know, understanding these logs is important, um, and especially in your local area, in order to be able to really help a well owner understand uh, what issues they might have. So as far as correcting poor construction, I mentioned earlier that a lot of wells were grandfathered in or have been. Um, you know, we did a study where we looked at um, about 1,700 wells in nine townships in a rural area, and uh, 40 of those wells were still in pits, and a number uh, wouldn't meet, uh, you know, probably 15 to 20 percent of those wouldn't meet well code today in Illinois just because they're older wells in a rural area, and, the, you know, the well still works, and so um, that's, that's just the way it is. You're not going to spend, you know, seven to $10,000 on a new well. Um, if it's working fine and, uh, and you think it's okay. So the problem with some of these old wells, though, especially in a pit or a hand dug well, is that not only are they an opportunity for surface contamination, if a well in a pit, you have a huge rain event, the whole pit floods with water, unless that well is perfectly sealed, which, you know, most well caps have a, a, a gasket to keep them sealed, but over time those things uh, rot or um, aren't as effective. And so if your well is more than even a few years old and you haven't replaced that gasket, then it's likely that it's not necessarily airtight anymore. So uh, plus they're just a safety hazard. So here's some examples of why. Um, I showed this picture again down at the bottom just because it's a great example of an old hand dug well. Um, the Washington State Department of Ecology is the uh, state agency in Washington State that regulates well construction and drilling uh, licenses for drillers. And so they have a blog uh, that we follow, and uh, they put this up. Uh, this is from a few years ago. But uh, you can see this well on the upper left. There's, you can see the pump there. Um, the woman who lived there has probably walked across that piece of plywood, you know, a thousand times. Uh, this time, though, she uh, stepped on it, and it broke, and it killed her. Um, but this is just isn't a safe way to have your well in the first place. You can see the concrete block was probably covering that small hole. Um, there's an old funnel sitting there. There's a broom in the corner. It looks like rotting insulation all around the edge. Uh, likely there could be mice in there that can fall in the well. Uh, it looks like some stuff's hanging. Um, it's just, you know, that's the water they're drinking. So it's just not a great idea. And the well on the upper left or upper right, uh, that's a goat that fell into a well. 
um, and no one noticed it for a while. So um, that's one of the extreme cases for sure, but uh, things like that happen. Um, you see cats, rats, uh, all kinds of stuff in wells uh, when you're in this field. And, um, you know, a lot of times people don't even realize why their water uh, smells or tastes funny. And, um, you know, they, it's just about being aware. So what should you do with these wells? You know, we certainly recommend you bring them up to code if that's possible. Um, a well that's in a pit, you should extend it to the surface, fill it in with clay. Um, yeah, talk to a local well authority or a county uh, health department um, or you know, a contractor and find out what they recommend. Get some advice from a number of people. And this, this is what we would tell a well owner. So as far as abandoned wells, um, well logs weren't required, I mentioned earlier, until at least the 60s in most states and in some states as late as 2000. And so um, in those states, like in New York, where they didn't require well logs to be filed uh, until 2000, they probably only have 10 to 15 percent of all the wells that are drilled in New York on file with the state. Uh, most of them are undocumented. And so um, when those wells are no longer being used, and they become an abandoned well that needs to be sealed, um, we find more of those wells and a lot of wells on property where um, there's certainly a safety hazard um, if no one even knows they're there anymore. So, um, and what we tell well owners is if you have an abandoned well on your property, you need to abandon it. It might cost a little money, but if someone falls in and gets hurt or killed, or you contaminate an aquifer and it, it's proven that you've caused that, you know, they're under a, uh, there's some liability there and risk. So these are just some more examples. Uh, the two pictures are both from the Wisconsin, or Washington State Department of Ecology I mentioned earlier. Uh, one guy fell 45 feet and I was very fortunate uh, that he walked away from it. And uh, you see all the time where uh, a tractor or some kind of livestock gets stuck in a well. And these, pic these uh, newspaper clippings are all from 1997. The third one is Jessica McClure, which if you're old enough to remember, she was, uh, her rescue was covered live on CNN uh, for like 18 hours, I think, uh, when this happened. Um, the other three are all from uh, regional papers in Illinois. And um, at least in the 90s, nowadays with the internet, it's probably a little different, but you just don't hear about these things happening. So Galesburg didn't know what happened in Buffalo Grove, and Buffalo Grove didn't know what happened near Springfield. And, you know, people have died from falling in wells, and it just doesn't make it past, um, you know, the local paper. So it happens more frequently than people uh, realize. So as far as groundwater and health gaps, um, well, you know, what I've learned as a groundwater hydrologist, and my training is um, my undergrad's in ag engineering and my master's is in civil. But I've worked here for over 30 years. So most of my work has been as a groundwater hydrologist. And what I've learned is that um, I don't know a lot about public health. I'm learning um, every day, honestly, um, but it's the same way on the other side. A lot of public health professionals don't take training in groundwater, don't have a geology degree um, or an engineering degree where they've learned some of those things, and so don't understand how complicated groundwater can be. Uh, for instance, I mentioned earlier, um, right where I'm at, you could drill and hit three different aquifers. Well, if you're looking at health effects from uh, private wells, you have to consider that not everybody in your area might be using the same aquifer, and they have very different chemistry, especially if one is bedrock and the other is sand and gravel. Or you know, if you're in an area with all dug and bored wells, then every single well could have a different chemistry because it's all from the water table. It's more locally sourced. Um, it doesn't necessarily follow a typical pattern that an aquifer would. Um, you know, that's, that's larger and water's flowing through it, it's, and it's the mineralogy is based on the source minerals, uh, that sort of thing. So, um, and also well water issues aren't straightforward. Um, we, we've seen, and I mentioned John Hopkins here, I don't mean to, uh, Johns Hopkins, I got that spelled wrong, I don't mean to disparage those folks, but we were asked, I was asked to go sit in on a meeting to talk about private well issues, and they had taken uh, something off of EPA's web page on community well issues and slapped it on as private well issues or private or public water supply issues and slapped it on this uh, paper that they provided us on uh, private well issues. Well, one of the things listed were algal blooms. 
because that is a community health issue for pro uh, public water supplies, but it's certainly not um, a private well issue. So there's some misunderstanding about how private wells might be different than a public water supply. Um, you know, we tell people all the time that um, as a private well owner, you are the water operator of a very small water supply, and that's certainly true. Um, there are also issues about the type of samples that you collect. Um, water that's collected from a kitchen tap can be very different from the water collected from an outside spigot where it's not ran through a softener, a filter, or any other kind of treatment device, or it hasn't set in the pipes in the house overnight. So knowing the difference between those, I know what Dan does is he talks to the well owner whenever they call about getting a sample, and most of the time, uh, if they have any kind of treatment at all, he gives them two sets of bottles and has them collect one at an outside spigot that's near the well that would be before any kind of treatment, so you're getting a better representative sample of groundwater quality and then one at their kitchen tap that's more representative of what the folks are actually drinking as a drinking water sample. So, um, yeah, and dealing with well construction issues we already went through, um, plus there's no real information on treatment or bottled water as far as uh, when you're out looking at uh, health effects uh, linked to private wells. We have really no information on who's really drinking their water versus who's just using it for showers, uh, who uses bottled water, in, in other words, or what kind of treatment people have. And um, unless you're asking those questions when you're collecting the sample, um, a lot of times you just don't know it. Um, I know we were contacted by a state attorney general's office and they wanted to know what percentage of well owners in their state were using treatment? You know, I don't think anyone knows that information. Now, our lab, uh, Dan's lab, does ask that question whenever they talk to a well owner. What kind of treatment do you have? And again, um, sometimes collect two sets of samples. And so we do have a little information here in Illinois um, for just people who've called us about getting a well sample uh, as far as whether they, what kind of treatment they're using, whether it's just a softener, if they have a filter, if they have an RO unit. I know uh, Dan and his staff looked at that at one point um, when this question came up from the Attorney General's office and found that almost 10% of the samples that we get in our lab, uh, folks had RO. And I think uh, reverse osmosis, and I think that's probably really high versus, versus what um, if you could sample every well owner, I think it'd be more like two or 3%, and that's just my opinion. Um, but these are people who are more conscientious, who are sampling their wells, and so they're more likely to have treatment is what we've concluded. So the bottom line is um, professionals from both disciplines can really learn from each other. And what we suggest is they should take a team approach. I know um, with the RCAP folks who are working around the country, a lot of them have developed relationships with uh, their state health departments or a local health department. Uh, two good examples of that are Madison County, New York, where they have a grant from CDC to do sampling. So the RCAP uh, regional folks there are going out and with them and helping with assessing uh, well vulnerability. I'll mention our assessment tool in a little bit. Um, another is in uh, Tennessee. Our CAP's working with the state health department where they're sampling springs. Uh, really, um, our program is for private wells, but you know, springs are groundwater that's seeping out of the ground at some point, and they're typically uh, have high bacteria issues. And so taking this team approach um, gives each group um, more information and we can all learn from each other again is the bottom point. Um, as far as a high arsenic example, I don't remember what that was, but the lagoon example, um, we've developed this assessment tool which I'll talk about in a little bit and one of the things that came up while we were developing uh, questions related to septic is uh, in Nebraska they allow lagoons for an individual home septic uh, system, which I had never heard of. And so I contacted one of the county health departments here in Illinois that I rely on, um, one of the health folks there, and she relayed, well, we even rely, allow that in Illinois. We don't see very much of it, but there were two in their county uh, where folks actually have lagoons for their septic. And so, um, like I said, we can all learn from each other, and um, I know I learned a lot about what I don't know uh, by working with a team on developing this assessment tool. And it is, it's just very different everywhere. Um, I just want to show an example uh, here. 
this is showing um, the bedrock is at the bottom is the white. It says bedrock of Silurian to Pennsylvanian age. Uh, the yellow colored Muhammad sand member is actually sand. Then there's uh, different glaciations left different levels of sand and gravel in different places. So you can see where this well was drilled. We're touching on four different aquifers. One at the top is a Cahokia formation. There's one uh, right below the C2 and there's one above the B uh, on this. So you could drill into four different aquifers uh, drilling at that one location. And maybe some others that we didn't have identified because the geology is so, um, you know, it's really complex in a glacial environment. And so um, not understanding those differences uh, really make a difference on how you interpret water quality data coming from private wells. So um, our advice and the best thing to do uh, on the best thing to do is to develop a relationship with your scientific surveys and I'm talking to health professionals here um, or a related groundwater resource agency in in Wisconsin that would be DNR um, there's a USGS office uh, in almost every state there's a state geological survey in every state Illinois also has a water survey with a groundwater section but there's a you know they go by a lot of different names uh, Department of Ecology in Washington State Department of Health and Human Services DEQ DNR um, those folks either uh, maintain the well logs or regulate well construction and drillers licensing and they will be able to guide you to uh, more resources um, like most aquifers in most states have been mapped and so you can find out where those are and at what depths they exist uh, there's a lot of information out there if you want to become more learned on groundwater resources and water quality so um, also the folks at map aquifers um, may be at a university um, so there's uh, also like our the research we do here includes a lot of applied uh, water quality work so like I've gone out I've probably sampled in all honesty literally nearly a thousand wells in my career uh, private wells and so we have a lot of private well information where if a well owner calls me up today and says I just bought a house in Champaign County um, it's in this township range in section um, I want to put a well in what can I expect I can look at all the well logs that we have on file and say well there's two aquifers here um, there's a shallower sand and gravel and here's the water quality there there's a deeper sand and gravel um, that might be a little higher in iron but you know here's what you're going to get for that and and you're guaranteed a resource it never goes dry blah 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 and so developing a relationship with those folks um, on that side works both ways and I know um, I've have been fortunate enough to work with a lot of public health or, uh, professionals um, environmental health professionals uh, in the work that I'm doing and uh, like I said I learn something new almost uh, every day so uh, that's my message to you as a uh, environmental health professional um, quickly I, before we get to the questions I want to talk about our private well class we find that most people who find out about our webinars haven't taken our class or even know it exists and so this all started five years ago with a 10 lesson class it's all written out um, it's self-paced. There's a place on our web page if you go to privatewellclass.org where you can sign up via email and it sends you one lesson a week for 10 weeks. It starts out talking about groundwater and how water moves to the ground, how it gets into your well, different well types, common problems, and it walks through a whole. It's meant to be kind of a, a basic but comprehensive uh, view of what it means to be a well owner and what situations might come up. And so um, what we find is that folks who've gone through our class um, certainly understand the basics of their well better and they're able to ask better questions that way when they have a problem or they have some kind of issue that they're concerned about. So um, our program's grown a lot in the last five years. We do these webinars once a month. Most of the time they're for well owners but also for other constituents like environmental health professionals and realtors and labs. And um, we record all these. We've developed some multimedia lessons. Um, we recently developed an entire version of our class in Spanish. So if you're in an area as a public health professional um, that has a lot of Spanish-speaking well owners, um, let us know. We can uh, get you hooked up uh, with that information. And uh, so I'm going to just show you. This is our front page. And if you click on the lower left where it says Learn by Email, It'll take you to where you can sign up for the 10 lessons. There's a lot of other resources here, though, uh, if you 
go across the menu items on top. For each lesson, we've also included a, a number of other free publicly available resources that either we used for some of the uh, figures that went into our lessons or that also explain some of the same concepts maybe in a different way. You know, everybody learns differently, and so we find that this resource list, and there's one for each of the 10 lessons, really provides a lot of additional information that people can use. Um, so, for example, we've uncovered things like uh, the, the first one here on the second uh, lesson, the Michigan Flowing Well Handbook. Well, there are flowing wells in a lot of places in the country. Um, not that many places, but uh, most states have places where there are flowing wells, Illinois included, but Michigan has a lot, enough that they were losing 28 million gallons a day of groundwater uh, to these open flowing wells. So they passed a law and they required them to cap those. And so that flowing well handbook has everything you'd ever want to know about flowing wells, in my opinion. And so it's really useful if you're in a situation where all of a sudden somebody has a, a well that's flowing and they need to deal with uh, what that means. So not that it's a problem. So uh, the overall goal of our program, for well owners anyway, is to give them targeted information so they understand that their well is important, um, that, so that they know how it works, and what they can do then to protect themselves from risk. And so um, it's really important that they understand those basic concepts because we found that a lot don't. And so, um, that's kind of what our goal is through this program. And what's really nice is we're funded um, through a grant uh, to RCAP from US EPA. And as long as they support private well issues like they have for the last number of years, um, you know, this program is completely free uh, to anyone. So, um, and that's really nice to be able to offer. So, um, as far as more information for environmental health professionals, um, we've, we work with NEHA, I mentioned that in the beginning. We actually created a version of our class on their website and their e-learning website. So as a um, sanitarian, uh, if you're a NEHA member and you, or your state allows for NEHA CEs, you can take each lesson, pass the quiz, uh, and each lesson is worth one uh, continuing education credit. And so um, we, we were approached by a Home Inspectors Association um, wanting to uh, also use our class and we um, I guess hooked them up with NEHA, and now NEHA is allowing their folks to go through that free class as well. And we were contacted by other groups about doing this as well, but they all wanted it only for their members, and they wanted to, to be able to use it as a, a way to increase their membership and charge for it. Um, and so we've declined to provide it to those entities. Um, because we're federally funded, everything um, really has to be free, and that's, that's our goal. So. Um, it says hosting workshops around the country this fall and next year. Uh, RCAP staff are doing those, both sanitarian workshops and uh, workshops for well owners. And um, we just reached out to them again to find out what classes. We're kind of in between grant cycles, and so most of those workshops have been done, and the new grant's about to start. So it'll be mostly next year that that'll happen. Um, but yeah. And uh, we've developed an assessment tool, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, that um, someone who has some wherewithal needs to actually use. But it's a tool you can take out and work with a well owner individually and walk through all the pieces of their well system and say, this is a risk, this isn't. Um, here's what you need to be concerned about. Well, why are you asking that question? Well, here's why. Um, and so it provides a one-on-one -on -one opportunity to teach well owners about why they need to sample, best practices, why they need to understand their well. So um, we do also have a partners page and a partner newsletter. And it asks you to sign up as a partner, but really that's signing up to get our newsletter, which comes out once a month. And I'm not sure if I have that here or not. I'll go through this. Um, we've done some specific webinars, uh, like this one on lead. Um, because of all the uh, stuff that was going on with lead last year and the year before, um, we pulled together some resources from a number of um, sources, including from uh, a f person at EPA, uh, Office of Research and Development, and uh, a colleague from Virginia Tech, and asked them to provide us uh, materials. And so we did this webinar and we created a web page, which I think I answer in one of the questions later. But it's, uh, you know, it's a lot of misunderstanding about lead, and so um, we tried to put resources together that would help everyone understand where this is a risk and, and what situations they might need to be concerned. 
Uh, this is the lead page, and you can get to that um, by just, uh, it's privatewellclass.org slash lead. And uh, the very, at the very top here, it says, in addition to working with technical es experts, um, that can get you to uh, the webinar that we did. We've created a bunch of short videos, like how does my private well system work? Um, the most popular video we have is how does my pressure tank work? It's had, I, I don't even know what it's up to now, but um, somewhere upwards of 120,000 views and, uh, since January of 2016. And what that tells us is that a lot of people have pressure problems that have private wells. And one, there's not a lot of information out there uh, to help them understand what they can do to, to, to deal with that. So this is a four to five minute long video um, there's about 16 of these on our website. You know, what do I do after a fire? What do I do after a flood? You know, what is a dug and board well? All just specific questions type things uh, that make good, uh, you know, a good quick understanding of that particular issue. Uh, like here, here's another one. How, what can I do when my well goes dry? We talk about, uh, you know, some areas you don't have any options when your well goes dry, uh, which is unfortunate. But in others, there may be options. So um, we started a podcast series. Um, I say started, we developed the first three lessons, uh, one, two, and three on this list, and then we've kind of stalled uh, since then. We need to develop podcasts for all the rest of the lessons. Uh, but they're pretty popular. I think we've had a, a close to 2,000 um, listens, if you will. And so, um, you know, there's trying to create a lot of opportunities for well owners to understand things about their wells. So as far as partner resources, I mentioned that if you go to the resource library page, uh, you can go to Partner Resources, fill out this information, and it um, it puts you on our, our newsletter list, basically. And so here's a list of all the newsletters we started in January 2016. Um, below that are, is like a flyer you can download and some other information about linking to our site. Um, the last time I checked was during Groundwater Awareness Week in March, but um, I think Katie found nearly 200 websites including, um, I want to say, 22 state health departments and, you know, somewhere upwards of 60 or so county health departments that link to our website and our program. Um, it's been vetted by a lot of uh, public health professionals, and so, um, you know, we're just trying to get the word out and uh, hope you will too. Uh, this is our second newsletter, and I just show this one because it's when we launched uh, the private well class on NEHA's website. And so if you go to this uh, particular newsletter or there's a blog post about this, you can uh, see on uh, how to get, how you weave your way through Niha's website. This is also free. You don't have to be a uh, sanitarian with Niha to take it, uh, but you do have to register on their site. Uh, but it's still free to take. And um, then as far as your accreditation, uh, that's another issue with Niha. But you can take our class on their site uh, free of charge. Okay, so um, I mentioned the private well assessment. So we've developed a workshop that's just for environmental health professionals. RCAP delivered, um, has delivered about 30 of these, I believe, around the country. Um, we've delivered uh, five or six in different uh, locations in person, plus we've done three online as a four-hour webinar. Um, the idea of a four-hour webinar makes me tired, I'll be honest, um, but it's actually been pretty successful. I think we've done it four times, and we've had about 160 people participate. Um, it is worth four NEHA CEU credits, and what it covers is really two things. Best practices on how to do outreach to well owners, and it's three detailed examples on how to use our assessment tool. And the idea behind that is as a public, as an environmental health professional working with well owners, uh, it gives you something to use, uh, almost you know, a check the box type of thing on showing well owners, well, they, they haven't sampled in 10 years, or maybe they've never sampled, um, what are some things that might be a risk near their well? What do you know about the well geology and all that sort of information? And so, yeah, what we did is um, we tried to model this after a, a sanitary survey. And for any of you who may be involved in that process, sanitary surveys are something that are required by law for a community water supply every three years. And some states have their own variation on those rules, but that's the minimum requirement. So in some states, it's, it's the public health departments um, that are going out and doing these sanitary surveys, and it's to review um, if a community water supplies, drinking water treatment and distribution and everything else, their well, their source water, are all uh, they're doing things in a, uh, the correct way under the Safe Drinking Water Act. 
Well, we took that approach and developed a site assessment tool um, that's basically a nine-page um, vulnerability assessment. And it, it goes over issues related to the site, the well, the geology, and then it, there's a place at the end for us to provide recommendations, uh, give pictures, take pictures, uh, and walk a well owner through all the potential uh, questions that someone might ask related to well and what could make it vulnerable. And so it's really an opportunity. Uh, RCAP has done um, around 1,100 of these around the country already, and they'll be doing more uh, with private well owners um, in the coming year or two. And so, um, and we, if anyone contacts us and would like a, vulner a well assessment done, um, we can get you to the right person at RCAP because uh, they have staff in every state um, to actually uh, get you to those folks. So it's really an opportunity for a one-on-one -on -one with a well owner to help raise awareness on why they should test, what best management practices they should be using, and to help them understand, especially if they're in a vulnerable geology, their well's in a bottom along a river, or they're in a karst topography, or uh, there's bedrock at the surface where there's more risk of surface contamination, or their well's really old, and they have well construction issues. So um, that's, uh, I don't know if I have another slide about that yet. So these are the pieces that are in that. I guess I didn't mention, um, rather than develop this on their own, we reached out to about uh, 13 uh, professionals, both uh, health department folks, drillers, uh, groundwater folks, uh, extension, uh, where they're doing a lot of uh, work in some states with private well owners and we developed this tool together. So it's been vetted by, you know, I, I didn't add up all the collective experience, but most of the folks who were involved had at least 20 years experience working on private well issues. And so uh, that's a lot of experience and from all over the country. And so we came up with this tool and uh, these are all the pieces to it. I won't go through them, but uh, it asks all the questions that um, could eventually be a question uh, lead to a reason for some vulnerability in the well or drinking water quality of a well. So, um, it, like I said, it's like a sanitary survey for private wells. It's a chance to educate well owners about their specific situation. And the reason that's important is because it, literally no two wells are the same. Um, there's always specific instances where something's being stored by a well or um, you know, rarely do you find a number of wells close by that are all the same depth, they're all constructed the same way. Sometimes you'll see that in a rural subdivision that was all developed over uh, a very short period of time. But in general, almost every well has its own uniqueness, and that's why it's important to understand all those things. So it also gives an opportunity to promote best practices and encourage communication. You know. I don't know how many questions we get from well owners saying, well, I don't want to go to my county health department because I'm afraid they'll tell me I can't use my well. So our first response to that is they're not there to shut off your well, nor do they have the legal authority to do that, except in a very few cases uh, in some eastern states where a county may have passed a law or a local health district may have a law that allows them to do that. I've actually only heard of, of two cases where that is uh, allowable. Um, so. Over 99.9% .9 of the country, um, environmental health professionals at a, at a health department are there to help you understand what your risk is. They may recommend that you don't test or use your well water, and they may recommend that you put in a different well, but they can't tell you you can't, and really they're there to try to help you protect your health. And so, um, you know, our mission or our job is to encourage that kind of communication and help them reach out to local sources of information. You know, um, I tell people all the time, um, you know, I can certainly help you with some basic issues, but I don't understand your local geology in another state. I don't understand uh, your local rules necessarily um, or any specific issues you might have if I'm not there. And so it's much more important for well owners to know who they can go to locally uh, to get that information and build that relationship. And so that's also part of our, our job. Um, so I'm going to go on to the questions that we got. We um, actually had over 600 people register for this uh, webinar, and it looks like we have a, a little over 300 in attendance. That's pretty normal. Um, and so we received a boatload of questions is the best way to say it. And so uh, we obviously can't answer all those um, today, but we'll get to some of them, and then we'll also uh, get to the, any questions if you're still on um, and you're interested uh, or something's come up that I've said that you don't understand or you have some kind of question, um, 
please use the question box and we will uh, get to those at the end. So although Katie, I'll warn you, I forgot to bring up the Google document, so I'll have to do that when we get to that point. Um, so what do I test for? Uh, we get that question all the time from well owners. And um, you know, one of the things we tell people, the second bullet there is ask your county or state health department for advice. We do certainly run into cases where the county's not sure, and I would say then go to your state. Um, but if, you know, I'll give you in a second what we recommend, but every situation is different. It depends on how deep their well is, uh, where their water's coming from, and by that I mean, do we know that this particular formation has arsenic in it or uranium in it or some other constituent uh, that's a known contaminant for the area? It's probably naturally occurring, but there's also other issues. Are you next to a gas station? You know, do you need to be concerned about those things? Um, one of the best things you can do besides asking your county or state health department um, is to uh, talk to your neighbors, your extension, other folks who uh, in the area who may know, even uh, well drillers likely know if there's any kind of natural occurring contaminant in the area. I actually had a well driller call me yesterday from Iowa who's drilling in an Illinois county and we looked up information. There's three different types of bedrock you can drill into at 900 feet, 1400 feet, or at 1700 feet. And because of the, uh, the sulfate that's in the water and some of the concerns about sulfur, um, they decided to drill 1,700 feet for this house, uh, which, you know, I feel sorry for the well owner. That's a lot of money. Um, but it's better water quality, so in the long run, it'll probably pay for itself. And so, you know, there's a lot of folks you can contact is the bottom line. And uh, one thing we do recommend, and I think this is pretty universal, is you should sample for coliform and nitrate annually. Um, they indicate a pathway into your well by themselves. Uh, coliform bacteria won't necessarily hurt you, and nitrate is only dangerous for uh, pregnant uh, women and their babies uh, to a certain age. I think it's you know under two is what they recommend. Um, but both of these are fairly ubiquitous in the surface environment, and if you have either of these in your well, it means that there's probably some vulnerability or pathway into your well. Um, and so that's why they're always recommended to test for as a, an indicator uh, you know, coliform is called an indicator bacteria, matter of fact. So um, there's also other sources of information. So here, Massachusetts DEP has put up this website uh, where if you're a resident in um, Massachusetts, you can type in your address, and if you have a bedrock well, it'll tell you your probability um, of being concerned about arsenic or uranium. So they know they have this constituent naturally occurring in the environment, and so they've provided a tool for well owners in Massachusetts um, or, you know, any health district in Massachusetts uh, to look at this issue, uh, whether they need to recommend to a well owner uh, that they should sample for these things. An another example, this is from Rhode Island. I, I, I love this example because all the little circles are old orchards where arsenic was extensively used and it's in the surface soil and it very well could be in the shallower groundwater. Um, but the big splotch that's in the middle third of the state is where they know there's beryllium. And, um, you know, that's not a common thing. Um, but in Rhode Island, they have a big area where there's high beryllium. And until I saw this, uh, you know, a few years ago, found this on Rhode Island's website, I didn't realize beryllium was even a regulated contaminant. It comes up that infrequently um, that I didn't understand that was, uh, you know, communities have to treat for it if they have it. So, um, Looking for these sites is just something that where your state may have information uh, that will help you understand uh, the water quality uh, in your area. And the, the best example I have here is, uh, and there's a number of these that are going up, um, and I think in a few years you'll see a lot more of these sites in different states. But um, Wisconsin, through uh, their Department of Natural Resources, uh, had Stevens Point, uh, University of Stevens Point, create this uh, GIS version where you can go in and I selected arsenic by county and it takes all the private well samples that they have records for and it categorizes them by average. So um, the blue area there was none detected, uh, the green area they found arsenic uh, less than five, basically PPB, and if you're not familiar the health standard for arsenic for a community water supply is 10. And so you can see where the average sample, uh, and there's three counties there where the average sample was over 20. Uh, PPB, and so if you're a well owner, um, that might indicate you want to test for arsenic, 
or if you're in one of those counties, it may be where you, you know, put out information uh, for your well owners. And the ones that are clear I mean they have no uh, sample results uh, for arsenic anyway. So uh, these tools are coming along. Um, there's some I'm not going to talk about today uh, because of time, but uh, there's a lot of resources out there. And, you know, um, so getting to answering my question, here's what we recommend. Um, we recommend sampling for coliformin nitrate annually, as I mentioned. Uh, they're an indicator, and if you ever have those, then you need to look at why. Um, and it could be that uh, there's a breach in your well, or it could be that your well's shallow, and it's too close to a source, a uh, feedlot, or a septic tank, one of those things. Um, and then if you've never sampled your well, we recommend you sample for the suite of uh, uh, mostly uh, inorganics and metals. And it's to give you an idea of what your groundwater quality is, kind of a, just a snapshot. Um, what, what I've learned about uh, if it's in a regular, quote, regular uh, sand and gravel aquifer, um, for instance, we have an aquifer in Illinois where I have monitoring wells, and we sample them once every 10 years or so. Um, one of these wells uh, is atypical in that it has low arsenic versus all the others that have arsenic between, say, 30 and 100 this one well has arsenic always around three. Um, I can go back there today and if it's been 10 years and it's still gonna be around three. It might be four, it might be two, um, or a well that's 40 might be 38 or 40, 44, um, but it's gonna be close. Uh, in a typical aquifer, um, it's the mineralogy that dictates what the water quality is like. And so that's uh, very consistent. And so uh, the point being here that if um, your TDS is a certain value or your um, pH is 7.2 and you come back and sample uh, three to five years later and your pH is 6.2, um, why? You know, there, there has to be a reason because it just wouldn't change that dramatically. And so um, it's a way to uh, have some confidence that, you know, your aquifer is still, uh, quote, pristine, if you will, or um, it's, it's the same water quality that it has been that there's been no influence from somewhere that you're not aware of. And, uh, and, and we also, as we say, we always say get advice from your local or state health department. And, uh, you know, I'll give you the same advice that I give labs, and that's that we tell well owners uh, with labs that if a lab can answer the question, they should go find another lab because you want a lab that understands private well issues. And so it's certainly, um, uh, I know it's not always easy, uh, but it's certainly important that uh, you're able as a, a local health department to answer their questions or know where to get those answers. Um, so Dan, um, I've left you out of this so far. So um, do you want to take this? Sure. Uh, I'll go ahead and do this question and maybe some others. Uh, the question here is, how do I eliminate uh, sulfur or rotten egg smell and brown rusty color? Um, let me look quickly through this answer. Uh, Chlorination is, is usually used uh, to get rid of the, the sulfur smell. Um, the, the way the reasoning goes, it's usually attributed to a sulfur-reducing bacteria, and that bacteria is, is uh, taking sulfate and converting it to hydrogen sulfide. And so the, the, uh, the uh, chlorine will, will uh, kill the bacteria. It'll probably also oxidize the hydro, uh, hydrogen sulfide um, and uh, eliminate it that way. Um, a lot of people will say, hey, I've, I chlorinated my well and the, the smell keeps coming back. Um, I've had some health department people tell me uh, once uh, it took a customer seven times uh, chlorinating the well to get rid of the layers. Uh, they describe like a layers of, of slime, uh, things like that. Um, so you could try repeated um, doses, but if none of that works, you may have to go to continuous uh, chlorination um, to uh, if it's really annoying for a, a citizen. Um, the brown uh, color is almost always rust, or, or it could be dirt or, or other sediment. I usually tell people to make sure they have, uh, just to protect their water treatment equipment, it's a good idea to have a sediment filter uh, right after your pressure tank. Um, a common one is a, a 0.45, I mean, uh, 0.5 micron. I, I'm sorry, actually, I, th I think that's wrong. Um, I probably told you wrong, Steve. I think it's in the lab, we use that. In for homes, it's around five microns. Um, yeah, I think I slipped a digit but, there. Sorry about that. No, it's probably my fault. Um, but the uh, although we've had some people um, say that some sediment does get through their five micron, so you can try a smaller pore size. Um, what'll happen probably if you go too small, it'll plug up faster and they'll probably lose water pressure. 
Um, but for dissolved iron, just the last thing I wanted to mention here is that for dissolved iron, uh, you do have to add, the, the physical filters won't take that out. Um, softeners mostly do a pretty good job with that. Um, if you have really high iron, you might have to get some type of uh, oxidizing filter, uh, a manganese green sand or other aerators or um, chlorine injection, something like that. Um, tannins uh, are another thing that are dissolved organic matter uh, that may make the water look brown, uh, and that won't that won't um, be filtered out with a normal sediment filter. That'll be something you have to pursue additional treatment for. Anyway, that's yep. Yeah, okay. Okay, so the next question is, if I shouldn't add chlorine bleach to my well each spring, how, how do we sanitize our well? Uh, Steve, do you want to handle this? Or? Yeah, um, I'm sorry. So no, it's um, right. we get a lot of questions about well disinfection, and there are a bunch of questions today on different aspects of this. But um, we, we hear from well owners all the time that, you know, oh, my driller told me to add a cup of bleach every month, or I, I, I put bleach down my well every spring or whatever. Um, you know, none of those are a good idea, especially straight bleach. It's too concentrated. It can be helpful, uh, harmful to your well components. And what we did for our classes, um, I meant, you know, I showed you earlier we have, for the 10 lessons, we list a bunch of extra resources. Well, in lesson 10, which is really about treatment, um, we link to this Minnesota Department of Health uh, document. And it's, uh, to me, it's the most comprehensive and useful guide on how to disinfect your well of, of all of them that we've seen. And there are literally uh, well over 50 that we've looked at. Um, it's detailed. It has a chart that tells you how to mix it so it's the right concentration. Um, it's got safety reminders like to shut off your pump. Um, a number of things uh, that uh, just make it, you know, it really includes everything that you need to know. Uh, and it's what we would recommend to well owners. Um, and so, again, it's under Lesson 10, under Water Treatment Solutions in our class resources. Uh, Oh, where am I at here? Okay, so so like yeah, they show pictures. They tell you how to mix it based on the size of the well and what the water level is, um, you know. And it, it even reminds you of things. And they even have things for what to do with your filter, your any kind of softener, what to to go around or what uh, to unhook. Uh, reference the Water Quality Association, which represents all those manufacturers, where you can get more information uh, from the manufacturer directly on. Uh, you know, hey, I'm going to disinfect my well. Uh, here's what you need to do with uh, your this treatment device so you don't, you know, cause some kind of problem by running chlorine through it. So uh, this is what we recommend. And really, um, I'm not sure I said it here in the beginning, but you should only, uh, people shouldn't treat their well unless there's a reason to. And, and that means there's been a bacteria hit. So again, going back to that, why you should sample every year. Um, you should sample uh, for coliform and nitrate every year, anytime your well's been opened, anytime you notice a change in water quality, uh, taste odor or smell, uh, just get an idea. And um, you shouldn't treat until you have a reason to. Uh, so you shouldn't any kind of treatment. And, and so uh, you shouldn't disinfect a well just for the sake of disinfecting a well. Um, it should be done because there's a problem. So... Um, so moving on, there were a number of questions about regulations as well. Um, some dealt with federal rules, and just to sum this up, there are no federal regulations regarding private well uh, or private well water. Uh, there just there aren't. It's uh, not in the Safe Drinking Water Act at all, and that's what regulates drinking water quality for community water supplies or public water supplies. And a private well, by definition, is not that. And so um, you know, another question here about federal, state, and local level. I touched on this earlier, but they really vary by state and even by health districts. Um, when we were out in Massachusetts uh, last uh, January, um, we did this four-hour workshop for some uh, local health districts, and one health district told me that they actually can, uh, they can abandon a well. They have the authority to do that, where other health districts that maybe have been right next to them, and these are small, you know, Massachusetts is a small state. It's maybe a fourth of the size of Illinois, I'm guessing. Um, and there's over 500 local health districts. 
and each one can make its own rules. So that versus you know a state like Illinois, where our state health department uh, works with all the counties that are under their uh, umbrella, if you will, and all the rules are the same or close to the same uh, throughout the entire state. So when you have those issues going on, um, you know it's really a tenuous task to understand what the state and local level rules are regarding private wells private well water quality, uh, even well construction. And so um, you need to, to check locally. Um, if you're someone who's asking this question as uh, not understanding your local jurisdiction. Um, and if you need help, we'd be glad to, because we're still trying to get our arms around this. And so uh, the more we learn, uh, the better we're able to help other folks. And so if, uh, you know, one thing I probably haven't mentioned through all this is uh, at the bottom of our web page, uh, there's an email link. It's info at privatewellclass.org. You can email us anytime with questions, and uh, we will get back to you and try to uh, help you. So, And that's not just for well owners, but certainly for uh, health professionals and others that um, may want some of our resources or uh, some other kind of support. So. Um, so well inspection, uh, do states require periodic inspection or testing of water? Again, no, none that we know of. Um, the only rules that we do know of are, I mentioned New Jersey. There are several states like New Jersey now that have laws that say when a, um, a property is sold, then a well has to be tested prior to that uh, sale going through. Um, but there's no periodic inspection or testing. Uh, some states have been inventive about this. Um, you know, what we tell well owners is that if you're going to buy a home, um, I would have a well inspection done. You know, I would make sure I understand everything about that well before I bought the property. And it is, it's buyer beware. And so that's typically the, the answer we would give. I know, um, like the state of Wisconsin, they have a form on a, for a well inspection, and their law is actually very practical. It says um, you don't have to have a well inspection, but if you have a well inspection, you have to use our form and you have to use a licensed contractor or driller to complete it that has a license in Wisconsin. And what their form does is it uh, has them inspect the well versus the current well construction code. So they can list any deficiencies in the current code and then explain what that means. Uh, some are not that important. Uh, maybe you're on a very uh, elevated uh, part of the landscape and their well is supposed to be 12 inches above grade and it's only 10. You know, I would certainly not pass on a, a home because of that particular issue, but it may be something much more important. In that way, um, you know, you're, they're trying to guarantee that the homeowner and the buyer are protected by making sure it's done by someone who knows what they're doing. So, um, and as far as the second question here, what have you found to be the most practical common or minimum setback distances? There was more to this question, um, but I, I don't believe there, uh, any of these values um, are the most practical common or minimum. Um, so the, usually the requirements are for a minimum setback, and most states have that rule. And that's really meant to provide um, some arbitrary level of protection. Um, some of those were decided by a committee some may be decided by, uh, you know, the head of a health department. Um, you know, some don't have any of those rules at all. But a good setback distance really requires you to understand the well, the geology, the landscape, uh, and the soil type. You know, um, if you have a, a 400-foot well that's in sand and gravel, so the screen's at 395 to 400, and it's on an upland area with good clay, the upper 30 or 40 feet, um, you know, then you could have, uh, you, you're much more likely to have something closer to the well not have any impact on the well water quality than if you're in an area where it's sand at the surface, where there's water flow uh, is flowing in a certain direction in that shallow aquifer or where um, bedrock's at the surface or it's karst geology, whether it's considered more vulnerable. And so, um, so yeah, I just use as an example, in many cases, and 100 foot is an example, like for a septic, 75 or 100 foot seem to be fairly common. Um, in most cases, that may be fine, but there are certainly going to be places where that's not fine. Some states have started to create rules where they say, in this particular geology, 
you have to do more to determine what that setback should be um, because they're identifying that those are real problems. So, um, yeah, in some cases, you know, there, it's, it's going to be tough to find a minimum setback on a small lot uh, that's appropriate. Um, Dan, I'll let you take this question. I, you know, I might not answer it quite the way you gave it to me, but I tried to just stick to the main issues here. Okay, sure. Uh, the question was, could there, could there be too many minerals in groundwater that would make it too alkaline? Um, I, I think uh, what they're getting at is probably a, a, a pH question here. Uh, does it, alkaline, alkalinity uh, to me means the, the acid neutralizing capability of water, which is related to the carbonates and bicarbonates in the water. Uh, so I, when I read this question initially, I was thinking uh, pro that possibly there, the question regarded um, this, these amounts of um, calcium carbonate, typically, or magnesium carbonates that, that are also associated with hard water. So uh, if that was the issue, I, I put in here um, that they do add alkalinity to the water, but usually the concern is with the, the minerals themselves the hardness minerals, the calcium, magnesium, and so if water softener is the most common thing to take those out, and then it exchanges that for, for sodium, which uh, doesn't tend to leave the, the scale and residue that the hard water does. Um, the, when you do have water, when you do have those minerals, they do raise the pH up to, say, 7.5 to 9, and I don't really think that that's usually considered uh, to be concerning. Uh, there are some cities that will have pH around 9. Um, sometimes even a little higher. Uh, you know, we don't, I don't know what other places, other places in the country see, but we don't usually see water that has pH of like 11. I guess if it did get up that high, it would be uh, probably concerning. Um, and then I'd have to look into it more or figure out, you know, if there was a local issue contributing to that. But I, I don't think too many people are going to have to worry about uh, water being too alkaline. Thank you. Sure. Uh-oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. My phone's ringing. Um, okay. So uh, as far as well codes, are there national codes for installing a well? You know, each state has its own. There's no national code. And in, I'd mentioned uh, Pennsylvania before not having a well code, and neither does Alaska. Though um, I know Alaska has formed a work group, and they're looking into that issue, and they're raising a lot of public awareness about the fact that they don't have uh, some of those rules. And so, um, you know, I think Alaska may be dropping off that list fairly soon. Um, and I accidentally left this in here. Um, I'm going to skip this because this is from a different time. Okay, sorry about that. So shock chlorination, um, more about that. When adding chlorine, uh, can't that cause oxidation issues that could lead to the release of metals like arsenic? So I'm going to answer this and then let Dan add some stuff in. Um, certainly chlorine is an oxidant and it can mobilize metals, uh, but um, you know, following the correct procedures, which we described earlier, uh, you shouldn't see, one, you know, what's recommended when you disinfect a well uh, is when you shock chlorinate it, is you run water through all, you, you mix up the chlorine, you put it in the well at the right amount based on the well volume and then you run it through all the taps in your home, toilets, uh, showers, faucets, uh, hydrants, so that you've got chlorinated water sitting, uh, and then you turn them off. So that, that chlorinated water, it's best to let it sit overnight, and it kills any bacteria that might be anywhere in the line. Um, and then once you start running it again, um, you turn them all back on until the chlorine's gone. And so if they're, to me, and Dan, correct me if I'm wrong here, but... Um, once you've eliminated all the additional chlorine in the well, then there shouldn't be any more release of those metals. Uh, for one, they have to be there. So some areas have, for instance, arsenic was really the question here. Um, we have a few aquifers in Illinois that have naturally occurring arsenic, and it's actually in the source material. It's arsenio pyrite in the, uh, that's part of the matrix of the, of the aquifer material. But in a lot of other areas, there is none. And so um, it has to be there for one thing. And um, it has to be, yeah. So, Dan, anything to add? Yeah, I think that's a pretty good answer, Steve. Uh, I'm not aware of those issues. Uh, I would think that when you, the whole idea is you're going to you let this sit a while, 
uh, usually overnight, at least six hours, I think is what the typical recommendation is. And then you're going to flush all that chlorine away. Um, I, you know, sometimes there's been concern about, oh, am I going to have lingering chlorine? Um, sometimes you'll read things that say it might need to take a couple of uh, well volumes of, of uh, flushing to get rid of the chlorine. Um, but I think a lot of times they'll say you can uh, test it with a like a chlorine test strip or something. And once you get rid of that chlorine, I would think you're you're getting rid of any of the other um, like arsenic or anything that might be released with those things. Um, so I, I wouldn't think that would cause too many problems like that. Um, so yeah, and I wanted to mention here there was also a number of questions about getting more training or more. Uh, educational materials, and so I just put it in this one um, question. Can you recommend an organized approach uh, to mentorship for LEHPs on well training and well issues really was a question. Um, and, you know, I would ask just contact us, and we can talk about it individually. Uh, we certainly have materials, some of them I mentioned today, uh, like our class. It's a good place to start, um, but we can also um, work with you to find other folks maybe in your state or area. And, uh, you know, this is one of the reasons why we are working with NEHA is um, when we started the private well class, uh, there's an evaluation at the end after the 10th lesson. And it asks you to list, you know, are you a well owner, a environmental health professional, a driller, you know, a bunch of different categories. And 22% of the people, the first probably, I don't know, 800 or 1,000 people that took our class were sanitarians. And so um, that's when uh, we realized that, uh, we reached out to NEHA and found out, yeah, there's really not a lot of material out there for uh, environmental health professionals on private well issues. And we got comments back from people like, boy, I wish that I had this when I started my job or uh, things like that. And so, um, which is why, you know, like why we're doing this webinar. And so whatever we can help you uh, do, we certainly will. And uh, we want to be a resource. So I guess that's really um, and even, you know, we get calls and um, when people are out in the field and they uncover some oddity with a well, which, you know, will happen more to you than you realize if you uh, go out and look at very many wells. Um, a lot of times, uh, send us a picture. We can we either know what's going on or we can contact someone. I know uh, one or two of the drillers here in Illinois, I've contacted them more than once with a picture saying, hey, what is this? I've never seen this before. And it's... Um, Many times it's come from one of the RCAP staff who are out doing these well assessments and they find some really unique situation. And, uh, you know, I haven't seen it before either. And so uh, it's about having contacts and resources available. And so we're certainly uh, willing to help with that. That's, you know, that's why we've, you know, it's part of our grant, if you will, is to provide uh, those kind of services. So um, just some basic things, you know, if anything happens to your well, flood water, or if there's been a fire, you know, we've got pictures, of, we've got a video on um, what to do after a flood and what to do after a fire, if you want to look those up. But if, and uh, one thing that never gets talked about is everyone's got this nice airtight well cap with a gasket on it so that it's sealed and it's, you know, nothing can get in. Um, but especially if you're in an environment where there might be freezing and thawing during the year, um, those gaskets get brittle. Um, I can really think of a time that I've opened up a well uh, where the gasket's been entirely intact, all the bolts have been entirely intact, and it was actually a perfectly sealed well. So um, from my perspective, you know, and what we recommend is that if your well's been flooded um, and flood water's gone over the top of your well, you need to disinfect it. Uh, you just should just assume it's been uh, contaminated with bacteria because it, it's a very rare occasion, I think, where that wouldn't be the case. So um, in the same way, there, if you look at the, the video we have on what to do after a fire, you know, uh, there's recommendations there related to you should make sure if you know you, there's a risk of a fire getting to a home in an area where uh, there are forest fires and that sort of thing, um, you should make sure your well's unplugged, uh, your pump's unplugged. Um, we see all the time where somebody's... Um, you know, when a fire gets that close to a well, it can heat it up enough that it melts the wires and it turns the well on um, and turns the pump on and it'll just pump and pump and pump until it burns up the pump uh, because it's been hardwired, basically. So there's just a lot of things like that 
that are good best practices if uh, you're in an area where you might be making recommendations to well owners or you might have this issue come up if you are a well owner. Um, I already talked about lead. I didn't realize I had that in there earlier, but we did have a question How about lead. How's it getting to well water? And, you know, there are a few areas. Uh, we have one in northeastern Illinois or northwestern Illinois where there's a lead mine and there's natural occurring lead uh, in the ground. They're very rare. Uh, the lead issues you hear about on the news, uh, Flint, Michigan, and everywhere else, um, are, are really about premise plumbing in people's homes. Um, lead was allowed by law. Uh, matter of fact, in Illinois until the late 60s, I believe, um, it was in the plumber's code that you had to use lead. So any home that's prior to a certain date, um, and there's more information here on our web page, um, has a risk of lead. And lead solder... Uh, was allowed until 2014, and um, I believe that's right. I might be getting mixed up with lead components here. Um, that's why I said go to the go to our lead page because it's got a lot more information. But um, you know what we know now versus what we knew then um, have certainly led to a lot of issues. And a lot of times, lead uh, lead pipes doesn't mean you're going to have a lead issue in your water. It also has to have a uh, certain type of chemistry that's either low pH or some other corrosive uh, environment such that, um, you know, it's going to leach the lead off the pipe. In a lot of cases, um, they, like for community water supplies, they add in corrosion inhibitors that make the water uh, actually cause scale formation on those pipes instead of uh, actually leaching lead from them. So, um, yeah. Everything you hopefully need to know about lead related to private wells is here. And if you have any other questions, let us know. Like I mentioned before, when we did this webinar, I leaned on some folks uh, that I know uh, with EPA and uh, who are doing research related to lead, and we used some of their information uh, to do that uh, webinar. And so um, it's you know it's it's pretty up to date. Um, provides a lot of issues that you know that have been learned uh, since some of the you know, some, since some of the newspaper headline stuff has happened. Uh, again, another chlorination question, uh, and I guess the bottom line is, uh, you know, shock chlorinating a well is a necessity in a lot of cases because you have older wells where they're going to get bacteria hits and things like that. And so as long as you're doing things properly, uh, you shouldn't have those issues. But straight bleach or mixing the wrong concentration you know, it can damage not really your well per se. Um, it's more it's going to damage your pitless if you have one, um, any seals on your pump. And, uh, again, it can increase the potential for metals release. But, it, again, if you're doing it properly, um, you won't have to worry about that. But the guy uh, the putting a cup of bleach down your well every month was a well owner that I met with in northern Illinois. And so throwing a cup of bleach down your well really does nothing to get rid of any bacteria. Um, if you have bacteria anywhere in your line, it's never going to make it there. It's going to get too diluted. So it, uh, it's really a, a wasted exercise. Um, so, and lastly, um, what do you do if you've chlorinated your well and then you keep getting hits of bacteria? You know, what we recommend is once you've chlorinated your well, then you need to test it again, and you should boil it until you have tested and it's negative, but what if it keeps coming back positive? Well, that probably means there's some source nearby. So uh, a livestock or septic, as I mentioned before, or some kind of breach in the well. could be that your well is a shallow dug well, and it's at the same level as a septic unit, and it just happens to flow directions that way. And if that's the case, or there's a feedlot nearby, we've come across dug wells that are in the middle of a feedlot uh, with cows uh, been able to rub up against the well itself. And so um, in the example I mentioned here, uh, in Virginia, one of the RCAP folks came across a, a well where they kept having uh, bacteria hits. And uh, when they sent a picture, it was pretty clear uh, there was a large 18-inch uh, diameter uh, tree about a foot away from the well. And so what had happened there as the tree grew, the roots got around, around the well, eventually as they grew, they... Um, crack the casing, and uh, those tree roots harbor a lot of bacteria, and so, um, you know, that's going to be a problem. And if that does happen, typically your only recourse is to add continuous disinfection. Um, and Dana, 
taking the thing here. Anything you want to add to that? Um, no, I, I I think it's usually chlorine or ultraviolet light. There's probably some some other things, peroxide, but I think people usually use chlorine or ultraviolet light. I suppose if they could, you know, if you did find a crack, uh, maybe you already said that. If it were a tree thing, if if you had a well contractor, repair, you know, do what repairs they can do. But uh, beyond that, yeah, I'm not sure what else you would do. No, yeah, you're right. They probably have to either get rid of the tree um, and redo the upper so many feet of the well or put in a different well. Yeah. Um, a bunch of questions about funding. So is there funding for well, well rehabilitation? You know, there are some local programs. I know in Iowa they have a Grants to Counties program, um, but the only kind of, quote, national program, uh, USDA, it's tied to the Farm Bill, has a private well loan program. Uh, that's administered by a number of nonprofits uh, and technical assistance providers. Uh, NGWA, I think, is involved. And three of these six RCAP regions also participate. And they're able to give out uh, low interest loans uh, to well owners where they have an issue. Um, if anyone's interested in that, um, I think NGWA has a financing page that might list some of that. I'm not sure how up to date it is. Um, and also, I can get you in contact with the three regions if you're in those areas. Um, I know the program used to be uh, not everywhere. So even in uh, a particular region of six states that um, RCAP may support uh, one of the regional offices, it may have only been three of those states or parts of some of those states where that was actually uh, part of the program. And so I don't know all those rules, but I can certainly get in touch with somebody who can. Um, what are the most problematic health issues related to private wells? So you know, that's a, such an open-ended question. Uh, it really depends on where you're at. We've shown a lot of examples of different kinds of constituents. Really, it comes back to proper construction and regular sampling to ensure water quality. And, you know, my, my soapbox here is that every well owner needs to understand those basics, how their well was constructed, where, where it's coming from. Is it shallow or deep? Is it from bedrock or sand and gravel? Uh, and what potential risks they might have. So whether that means they're in a vulnerable aquifer, if there's natural contaminants, and again, as I said before, rarely are two wells the same. And so uh, as a health professional who's working with private well owners, um, you know, you really you have to equip yourself with those tools. And that gets back to understanding what's going on in your area. And that's why developing relationships like with the State Geological Survey or, you know, some other agency that has, you know, maps of aquifers and, and understands some of those well basics is so important. Um, that can partner with you. I know um, Extension a lot of times in a number of states partners with the State Geological Survey to do workshops for well owners. And, uh, you know, it's a great partnership because the Geological Survey folks certainly can answer all the geology questions and all that stuff. And uh, sometimes they'll bring in a driller then to work with them uh, in addition. So, you know, as far as understanding those basics and, you know, what's the most pressing issue, you know, you could also look at it. There's also the issue of the day, which I brought up earlier. You know, a year and a half ago, it was lead. Um, PFO and PFOS uh, are common ones these days that get brought up. It's whatever we find and becomes a big uh, media uh, thing, uh, typically. So the, the basics of poor well construction and well owners not really understanding their well just don't get brought up because they're not uh, flashy, if you will. So um, I need to bring up the questions real quick that those of you have asked. Katie, do we have questions? Um, yep, there are uh, five questions for okay, you I guys. I need to um, quickly pull up your email because I neglected to do that, uh, which is my fault. And then we'll, we'll take those questions if I can figure it out. Uh -huh. Sure. Um, one thing while you're bringing it up, Steve, if I could just speak a little bit to the CEs that um, people can uh, earn by attending today. Um, so if, if anyone is requesting uh, CEs, we do have an attendance form located under the handouts section of your GoToWebinar application that you can click on. It's a, a PDF and you can um, bring it up and fill out steps one through three and then you will be able to then email 
the completed steps one through three form to us if you're trying to earn NEHA credits. We'll sign step four and return it to you for submission. Um, if you do need a slide deck, a copy of that, or um, a certificate of attendance, I'd be happy to provide that as well. And Steve is bringing up the document that has our uh, email address on it. So. Okay, so uh, here's the questions that you guys have asked so far. Would you recommend an inline check valve for shallow wells uh, to protect the impellers? Um, you know, um, this isn't my area of expertise. Uh, flat out, uh, I would have to ask someone. Um, I can certainly do that. Um, like I said, there's a number of drillers that I work with um, that, uh, you know, whenever there's a question that I'm not sure of, I find somebody to answer it. I'm not going to pretend I know uh, what's going on there. So um, I really can't answer your question, but if you'll email us um, or if someone else who's on the call has an, a suggestion too, um, that's fine. Um, yeah. I... I don't, I'm not going to be able to answer that, so I apologize. Um, as far as the next question, I think that's probably for Dan. Uh, the next question is, can you speak about iron-eating bacteria issues? Uh, uh, similar to what Steve mentioned in number one, uh, I'm not really an expert on iron, iron bacteria. Uh, I think the common, um, the, the common knowledge, though, is that they'll, they'll form a slime, and you can... Um, Iron problems don't necessarily have to be due to the iron bacteria. There is iron in, in well, at least around here, most of the water around here has, has just naturally occurring iron that causes a problem. I think it would cause a problem even without the iron bacteria. Um, a lot of times the recommendation will be similar to what uh, is done for sulfur bacteria, that's some type of, a, or, or any other type of bacteria, that's some type of chlorination, um, uh, and then filtration out of the residue. But um, I would, yeah, I, I guess I don't want to act like I know more than I, I'm letting on about this. So most I, I think people will just try to chlorinate and get rid of it just like other bacteria. Um, but if they if it's, if it's they still have uh, iron in the sample, it's not going to get rid of the iron. So they would have to have a separate treatment for that. Okay. Um, do you have a checklist for typical causes for water quality issues, odors, cloudiness, taste, pressure problems? Dan, does your lab have something like that? Uh and no, then, not really. I mean, usually um, we deal with things on a on a whenever they occur. So, if someone has a certain kind of odor, then we try to uh, steer them in the right direction based on that. Um, odors and tastes can be tough anyway. So, I'm not sure if I wanted to make something comprehensive and and you know that I felt comfortable was uh, correct. It, I think it'd be tough for me right now. I'd have to look a lot more into it. I know there are um, there are references though for for common odors and 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 uh, and tastes in some analytical manuals, I think tastes. Um, cloudiness is usually, it, that can be a tough one. It, it's usually some type of dissolved gas, and I, I don't know that people are going to say it's definitely uh, methane or anything like that, but it's certainly, if, if you do suspect methane, that's something I would check, uh, you know, maybe with local experts to see if it's in your area. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, pressure problems is uh, another thing to check with your local experts if it's pressure because your your well's running low. Yeah, we, basically we don't have really have a checklist. There's just a lot of situations, uh, a lot of variables here. Well, and as far as pressure problems go, it's a very common problem. And, uh, you know, if, if, you, if your pressure tank is a bladder tank, I know I think that was one of the questions, yeah. the difference between bladder and pressure tank. Well, they're both pressure tanks. It's just uh, an older style pressure tank may use air. Uh, to keep to to create the pressure uh, that pushes the water through your home versus a bladder tank uh, has a bladder that you fill with air so it's separated from the water and the older style tanks are going away just because um, eventually the water can do, the air can dissolve into the water and it's uh, quote waterlogs your tank and so um, then it's less effective and your pumps kicking on more often or you can't meet pressure or um, it goes down quickly. There's, you know, there's other issues related to that um, with your valves um, or, um, you know, if you have a leak in your bladder tank and stuff like that. So those are really, um, there's, I guess we don't have a checklist that's not kind of, um, uh, those are more of a, uh, an equipment issue in that respect. And that's something more for a contractor or the person who installs those sorts of systems. 
So, uh, yeah. No, I was just going to say, can I say a little bit more about the pressure tanks? It's it sure. a really good question. Yeah, yeah, just one thing that it seems to come up more often than you might think is the failing pressure tank. And I think Steve just mentioned a waterlog tank. Um, I work with people where they'll have a pump, re they'll have to have a pump replaced, and those, that can cost like a couple thousand dollars. Uh, but there's a really simple thing people can do to um, watch the pressure. They usually have a, a pressure gauge on it, or a, 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 not necessarily a gauge, although some might, but some, at least some, a cap where you can measure pressure like you would a bicycle tire. And so homeowners can make sure that, that, that um, that's working correctly because they'll, they'll want to have a, a, they can check their specifications, but a fair amount of pressure in there to make sure that their bladder or, uh, or bag hasn't broken in there and the tanks become waterlogged because that, that's, uh, I think they usually say that's one of the most common reasons a well pump will fail because the, the well pump is kicking on and off too much. And often the pressure tank gets overlooked. Yeah, and we do discuss that in our class lessons, too, uh, about that issue. So um, as far as uh, the next question, how consistent are lender requirements for private well testing, and is there a resource for lender requirements? So this is um, a really interesting issue because um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So we, um, we do a webinar for realtors where um, – I looked up a bunch of different rules through um, FHA and um, HUD and and all that stuff. And even their, you know, the HUD manual for uh, giving a loan for a private w with a private well, their the HUD lender manual um, for like FHA loans is, is over a thousand pages. And even within that document, it's not consistent for how it treats a, a new well that's drilled and what its requirements are versus a well that already exists. Um, but also, um, they've changed the rules for their lending uh, through HUD um, over the years. And we found um, a really reputable source who is providing the wrong information uh, and writing letters in support of uh, to lenders for what type of sampling should be done, and it was wrong. Um, it was a letter that HUD had developed in the 90s and had been superseded. And uh, now the HUD rules say, uh, for instance, that um, for that kind of loan, uh, one of their loans, you have to use the local testing requirements that they have any. If not, you have to use a state. And if not, you have to meet all the EPA, safe drinking water, primary contaminants. Well, um, we don't know anyone who does that, uh, that last one because sampling for all the primary drinking water contaminants would cost thousands of dollars. And so you've seen all these uh, mortgage companies sometimes. Um, we found one on a mortgage company's webpage in Michigan where it was the wrong information. Um, like I mentioned, there was a, another reputable source that was providing letters to homeowners saying this is all they need to test for, and it was based on a letter from 1994 that was no longer valid. And so we've approached, I tried to approach HUD, um, USDA, and uh, we've made a little headway. Um, we think there should be consistent requirements um, because there aren't. I know in Illinois, there's no rules for testing um, like there are in New Jersey, but most of the time it's driven by the lender requirements themselves, and it really depends on the lender. So, uh, you know, the short answer is there are none, and uh, there are no consistent requirements. And, you know, HUD's probably the biggest, one of the bigger lenders as far as, um, uh, and for you know, VA loans, FHA loans, and HUD loans um, provide a lot of loans out there for homes, and you know it's not even consistent there. But it's um, you know a lot of this came up right before uh, in the six months before the election, and now getting any federal agency to um, look at this issue, at least in the short term, is a challenge for us, and so we haven't uh, pursued it since you know probably for the last four or five months. But there needs to be a more defined list of requirements um, for the simple reason that in one state, you may have hardly any requirements except testing for coliform and nitrate. And that happens in Illinois. We had a homeowner in Illinois contact us, mad, uh, upset, wondering why the state didn't have better rules because um, she bought a house the county health department told her her well was fine. They tested for coliform and nitrate. And about two years later, she tested her well, and she had 150 ppb of arsenic. Uh, arsenic's not a required thing, 
and so it wasn't tested for. She didn't have the wherewithal to understand that she should have done that on her own, and now she, her family's been drinking this water for two years. So she's called us upset and wanting to know how to get the state to change the rules. You know, Illinois is a, an agricultural state um, with a lot of rural areas and a lot of rural landowners, uh, large landowners, and who mostly want the government to leave them alone. Um, they're not going to pass a law like New Jersey has uh, for sampling every well under uh, for a, a really extensive suite of contaminants um, based on uh, the EPA's rules. And so, um, again, this all comes back to uh, what I always tell well owners uh, or homeowners or people buying homes. It's buyer beware. You need to protect yourself before you before you buy a property. So um, that was kind of a long answer. I apologize, but it's um, I spent a lot of time researching this issue, and there really needs to be some consistency. And I don't know who to go to. Uh, to try to uh, get that done. So, um, the next question, is there a concern with increasing sodium and chloride levels in well waters and aquifers from when road starting operations? Um, Dan, I can answer this. We've done some work here. Um, like if you want to pipe in, feel free. Yeah, thank I was going to say, yeah, mostly I was going to turn to our groundwater scientist. Uh, I, I know it's probably concerned with at least surface waters and fens and, and uh, nature preserves, things like that, but I'm not sure how far it extends into wells and aquifers. Well, it, um, what we know based on the Chicago area where, um, you know, Chicago has been an urban area for a long time and it keeps uh, spreading out to the uh, west and south, um, we see a lot of uh, suburban communities where their shallow groundwater has, uh, over the last 20 years, the uh, because of road salting, those values have just been increasing steadily. And so um, some that's close to the uh, secondary health standard now, and um, it's definitely a concern where you may have a shallower aquifer. Chicago's a unique case in that um, they use mostly Lake Michigan, but uh, the level, the amount of water they can take out of the lake has been capped by a, a court case. And so now they're going back to groundwater. And typically they use deep bedrock water up there. But as they start to deplete that, um, the only other choice is some of the shallow aquifers that are up there. And they're becoming contaminated. So um, it's certainly a concern uh, in a glacial environment where, or in an area where your aquifer is fairly close to the surface. Um, if it's an urban area, you're likely to start seeing uh, well water and aquifers contaminated with road salt. So we have a number of municipalities up there uh, where their uh, chloride values have tripled in the last 15 years. So uh, it certainly does happen. And as far as the last question here, um, a good sized pump, you know, I, you need to ask a well contractor. Um, that's not something that we deal with on a regular basis and so um, we don't install wells as far as uh, you know private wells go. We were on the research and uh, support outreach side and so I can't uh, answer your question. Um, so we have went over by a lot and I apologize. Um, if anyone has any other questions again there's our website, our, our email address. Feel free to contact us. And uh, even if it's, you know, tomorrow or the next day or whatever. And uh, that's also the email address you can use to get uh, our slide deck and a certificate of attendance if you need those things uh, from Katie. So uh, thank you for your time. And, um, yeah, everyone have a good day.